I moved to North Carolina in 2014. I was 14 and about to turn 15. I moved from Maryland and, to be honest, my mom made me move. I wanted to stay as far away from the country as possible, but that sadly didn't work out for me. Anyway, for a bit of background, I'm the youngest of six. When I moved down to North Carolina, it was just me and my sister who was left to finish school. I was a freshman and she was a senior in high school. She and I would never see each other during the day, but at the end of the school day we would have to wait at the bus lot for almost half an hour together for our bus to show. We were second load, which just meant that our bus would drop off some other kids and then come back to the school to pick us up to drive us home. I never had many friends when I moved there. I didn't like many of the kids, as they just seemed too immature for me. I did befriend this one kid who rode my bus. I remember when he and I were walking to the bus lot and saw that my sister was talking to one of the teachers. I didn't find it too weird at the time because she and I were new and she may have just been curious about a few things around the school. On the bus she broke down and told me about this one man in her math class that would stare at her and her friend and not to look at you and then look away when you made eye contact type of stare. This was full-blown staring. She asked him to stop, but he pretended not to hear her. Eventually, he stopped looking at her during period, and she didn't press the issue any further. When she saw him at the bus lot that day, she went to find the closest teacher so that he would stop bothering her. I asked her if she would show me who it was, and she replied that she didn't want to get anyone in trouble and to just finish up the rest of the year and hopefully she'd never have to see him again. So with that, we dropped the discussion. About a month later, around April, I noticed my sister physically panicking in the bus lot. She told me that the kid kept following her everywhere she went. She said she went to use the bathroom between classes that day and saw him walk into the girl's bathroom and stand at the doorway for a minute before walking out, not saying a single word while she was in the stall. She also told me how he was hanging around her work one afternoon, but since she worked in a shopping mall, there wasn't much she could do except hide her face and hope he wouldn't bother her. But there's one day that stood out to me the most out of all the other weird encounters that she had with him. It was one of the last days of us having experiences with him. My sister texted me during second period, asking me to walk her to the remainder of her classes so that way the kid was less inclined to follow her but even with me there, he still followed behind. As I was using the water fountain, she was using the bathroom when I heard a scream come from inside. I ran there since I was the only one in the hall. As I ran there, all I can see is the kid pressing his face against the stall door. I screamed at him to leave, and as he turned towards me, he stared at me with this confused look on his face. Then it quickly turned into one that could kill me if looks could do so. Since this was the first time that I saw him up close, I kind of took in the details of his face. His eyes seemed nearly lifeless as he drilled this evil glare into my face. His lips were as chapped as can be, with him licking them every few seconds. He kept moving his fingers across both his arms, as if he were scratching them because they were covered in chicken pox. Him staring at me felt like ages, when out of nowhere, his whole face changed and he looked as if he were terrified. He apologized and quickly ran out of the bathroom. My sister emerged from the bathroom stall a few moments later in tears. I called my mom and told her what had happened. She immediately left work to come pick us up from school early that day. The next day, we went to the principal and reported him. He got a three-day suspension for that incident and wasn't allowed to speak with my sister again after that. He didn't get classes changed, and the school refused to allow my sister to change hers, claiming it was too late in the year or something along those lines. After around two weeks of no incidents happening, he suddenly vanished without a trace. After a few days of not seeing him around, I asked my friend, who knew the kid's dad since he worked for his hardware store, what had happened to him. What he told me sent shivers down my spine to this day. He told me, you haven't heard? I figured everyone around the whole city would have heard by now. He proceeds to say the following. The kid was found raping his little sister by his mom. 
The mom tried to stop him, but the son beat her and raped her as well. When the dad came home later that night, he saw his wife and daughter crying in the room while the son was asleep in the bed. When the cops arrested him, all he told them was that he regretted not doing it to the girls in his math class. I honestly wish I had never asked that question. It still makes me want to throw up thinking that this could have happened to my sister had she not asked me to walk her to her classes that day. I was never the protective type before that, but now I don't hesitate when it comes to being weary with new people, especially when it comes to those who clearly don't belong in society. And this took place when I was halfway through my third year in college. The year before, I had moved into a student apartment unit, right next to campus with a friend of mine, Drew. At the end of that school year, he transferred to another college across the country, but he was impressively maintaining a long-distance relationship with his girlfriend, who was part of a separate friend group. At the beginning of the third year, I had a new roommate move in, who then disappeared and skipped on the lease after a couple of days because he immediately dropped out. I essentially had the entire apartment to myself. Fortunately, I still only had to pay half the rent because the landlord pursued the lease. I think because she knew I wouldn't be able to pay the full sum otherwise. So I had the whole apartment to myself for half the cost, minus the room key that the skipped out roommate took with him. To elaborate on the apartment unit, it was on the ground floor with two entrances, and the first was a front door with a strong lock that you could only turn the bolt on if you used your personal key to release the mechanism. To get to it, you need to use the same key fob just to get into the larger building itself. The second entrance was a glass sliding door with a screen outside of that. Only the glass door locked though. It did always make me feel kind of uncomfortable sometimes and I always wished that I could have had an upstairs unit with the glass doors led to a balcony. And between the doors is a living room and kitchen hybrid that leads to a hallway. At the end of the hallway was my bedroom, the inaccessible bedroom on one side, and the bathroom on the other side. I always had a thing about locking the doors because the college town wasn't necessarily that reputable. My first roommate was way more relaxed, and has never been one to adhere to stuff like that. Once I had the apartment to myself, I was always on top of locking the door. On top of all of this, I live in the apartment with my cat, who is generally really friendly when she gets past being scared of a person and hiding from them. She always runs at the door, meowing at me when I go to leave in a pretty adorable way. She ended up taking the drew as well. On to what happened. Towards the end of my first semester of my third year, I got a call from Drew. His girlfriend was graduating a semester early, and he was flying over to attend our graduation ceremony. I told him the situation with the other bedroom, and he said he didn't mind the couch. The allotted time came, and he showed up and set his stuff on the couch. Since I only had the one key fob, we basically passed it back and forth between us. I trusted him since I had known him for over two years. He had already lived with me, and I knew he had more money than me anyways so whatever I had probably wouldn't be worth the trouble of taking. We agreed that while I was working, mainly nights, he could have the fob and keep the glass door unlocked for me while he was around. The only time I didn't work nights was when I worked a day shift on Saturday. I had communicated with my roommate on when all my shifts were, so that he'd know when to be around and to let me in, since he would be busy running around between his girlfriend, his old college friends, and some local family. Drew's plan was to leave Sunday afternoon, so I was planning to go out to dinner with him before he left, but I hadn't told him about it since I worked at his favorite restaurant, and the management owed me two free meals for taking up some double shifts. On Saturday morning, I got up at around 9 o'clock, got dressed, and went to work. As I was leaving, I heard Drew taking a shower, and sure enough, the couch bedding he had set up was empty. I went out the front door and yelled at him to lock it behind me as I left. I remember being a bit miffed that my cat hadn't come to meow at me as I left. Work passed uneventfully, and I made it home and entered through the unlocked glass door. I didn't see Drew's bedding. 
I figured he had a friend come over earlier, so I tried not to think anything of it. I distinctly remember the smell of cooked meat. My key fob was on the counter, so I guessed he would be out for a while. I spent the rest of the afternoon and most of the evening waiting for him to show back up, before I passed him a text asking where he was. He informed me that the graduation had concluded quicker than he had anticipated, and had managed to catch an earlier flight back. He then pointed out that he had told me he was leaving, but I couldn't find a text about it and figured there was some kind of glitch and it was lost. Maybe I had completely forgotten the conversation, or we had both had a big miscommunication. I was kind of upset since I had made a plan, but I can't really be upset with my friend for not acting in accordance to things I didn't tell them about. I let it go and we continued to text for the next week. The next Saturday evening, I was texting him and he asked me how I was feeling. I was a little confused. I asked him about it. He said he just wanted to know if I got over whatever I was sick with the week before. I asked him what he was talking about. He said he assumed that being sick would have been the only reason I would have skipped work. At this point, I got that feeling that some of you might be familiar with. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I got a feeling of wrongness in my gut, like I was keenly aware that something wasn't adding up, but I didn't know what. The feeling grew, and I felt inexplicably terrified all of a sudden. I checked to make sure all of the doors were locked. I remembered what he had said about him leaving the week before, and asked him to recount his day. He had woken up at about 7.30 in the morning to his alarm. He had thrown on some workout clothes and had left to hit the university gym before 8. You can see where this might be going. I asked him when he got back, a little after 10 in the morning. He had left by the glass door and came back through it since he thought I would only have left for a short time before he got back. He had taken a shower and went to the ceremony, which was pretty short since it was an early graduation. He came back at around 2 in the afternoon and had his stuff packed up pretty quick. His plan was to stop by where I worked and say goodbye, but he said that he heard me moving around in my bedroom. He walked in the open door. The lights were off, but in the form of the light from the window, he said he saw me curled up in bed and that he had called my name a few times to say goodbye before leaving. At this point, I was getting short on breath. I don't handle anxiety very well, and my mind was reeling. I had to stop texting for a moment because I suddenly felt very vulnerable. I moved as quietly as possible from my bedroom, past the darkened bathroom, into the kitchen. My eyes were glued to the window, expecting to see some psycho plastered against the glass. But no one was there. A thought occurred. I snatched a knife from the drawer and basically tiptoed over to the bathroom. I stood there for what felt like half an hour, trying to control my breathing before starting into it, flicking on the light and throwing the shower curtain back, knife ready for some kind of hidden attacker. But still nobody. I calmed down and went back to my room for the phone. I asked Drew if he was sure it was me he had talked to, because I had already left for work. I hadn't skipped. He thought I was joking, but eventually came to believe me since I really wasn't the lying type, even for jokes. He admitted that he thought he had seen me curled up under the covers, and I was filled with dread. Someone had been in my apartment. Someone had just walked in, through the door, and slept in my bed. No, it was more than that. She had already been gone when I woke up. So who was in the shower? Who had I been talking to when I left? My cat's behavior that day made even more sense. She hadn't run up to see me when I left, because she was hiding from whoever was in the apartment. Drew and I were both talking to a complete stranger that had just walked into our home, because he didn't think locking doors was important. What was weird, though, was that none of my valuables were taken. My laptop was untouched. The TV was on the wall. I did an inventory of everything. I was missing some boxes of Pop-Tarts my parents had sent me that I never really got to eating since I'm not crazy about them. A half package of bologna, a few hot dogs, a box of oatmeal. My frozen stuff was untouched, as were any perishables like milk. When I saw the absent hot dogs, I suddenly got nervous again. I asked Drew what he had eaten, and he said he had stopped by a local Denny's on his way to the airport. 
I smelled cooking when I got back that day. Somebody had been cooking on my stove or in my microwave or something. It had to have been just before I got back, too. How close was I to walking into my apartment and ending up face to face with a stranger that had trespassed? I'm not athletic, and I didn't have anything like a knife or a weapon that I could have carried on me. I would not have won a fight. The next day, I called my dad and told him I'd like to get a personal sidearm. We immediately went to get one and I dumped the cash at the first gun he recommended to me, registered my name under it and applied for a concealed carry since I was 21. For the next year, I entered my apartment ready to draw my gun and slept fitfully at night. And what struck me is how absurd the situation was. Someone had broken into my home to take a shower, take a nap and make some food. Both Drew and myself had spoken to this person, none the wiser. Every so often, though, when I'm on my way back from work, I see that my screen door has been opened when I know that I closed it. I lock my doors, and there's no way for this person to lock them without being inside, so nothing's ever happened further than that. I'm honestly just happy that I never met whoever it was that invited themselves in, and to whoever it is, I hope we never do. For context, I'm a 5'2 female who couldn't handle herself in a fight against tissue paper. This happened earlier today, and I can't think of a better place to vent about it. I work for UPS as a city carrier. For those who don't know, that means I walk, a lot, through all types of neighborhoods. That being said, I work in a relatively small town, and while there are some parts of it that are more run down, I've never had any bad encounters until today. The last bit of my route is three streets that run parallel to each other, so you walk up and down one street, drive the car to the next, and walk up and down it, etc. I'd say it's a low and middle income area, but nothing that makes you feel uneasy. Just a bunch of cheap college apartments and run-down houses. I'm beginning the first of the three streets when I see a man, maybe 20 years old, riding his bike on the opposite side of the street but go in the same direction that I am. I think nothing of it and go about my business. He ended up turning a corner at the end of the block and I forgot about him. I'm continuing down the same street when I notice this guy is riding next to me again. I think it's a little bizarre, but figure he's just taking laps around the block or something. Mind you, it's a solid 10 degrees outside today, with snow on the ground. So looking back, it's a bit strange that somebody was out for a casual bike ride, but I guess people have done weirder things. I'm finishing up the last houses on that street, and heading back to my van, when I notice this dude is now following me again, even though I had turned around and started going the opposite direction now. I thought everything was a coincidence until I drove to the next street over. My first stop there is an apartment box. For those who might not know, it's one huge mailbox with several mailboxes inside of it. And all that means is that I have to spend a decent amount of time there because it's maybe 16 people's mails I'm sorting. While I'm doing that, the guy shows up again and just sits on his bike, blankly staring at me from a few yards away while I work. I again gave this all the benefit of the doubt, and think maybe he's just waiting for me to finish the box so we can check his mail. As I lock it up and move on to the next house, I see him following behind me. When I stop at a house to deliver, he stops right behind me and stares. At this point, I decide there's something weird going on, and that I need to distance myself from this man and go back to my van, despite having almost the entire street left to deliver. I go back to the post office and tell my boss about what's happened, and he agrees to have me go deliver mail for another route on the opposite side of town. I gladly do this, and it takes maybe an hour and a half. I figured they'd trade off the mail and somebody else would go finish that small portion that I had left with the creepy dude. Not so much. Once I get back to the office, they ask me to go finish the route from this morning. I was hesitant, but the point was made that it was hours later, and it started raining, because why would he be there two hours later and on a bike in the rain, and that they'd send somebody to patrol the street. Fine. I head back out with a co-worker following in another car behind me. 
I finished the street I had left earlier without any problems, so he heads back to the office. I move to my last street, feeling relatively at ease and starting to wonder if I overreacted this morning. I get to the end of my first half of the street. Conveniently, the farthest away from my vehicle that I can get during this entire ordeal. And there he is. He pops out from behind the house on his bike, riding furiously in my direction. Panic sets in. I try to stay calm and act as if I wasn't bothered by his presence at all, but he's riding right on my heels, speeding up to get in front of me, and then just blankly staring through me again until I pass him, and the following continues. I casually put my mail into my bag so my hands are free, that way I can get to my mace as I call my boss. I didn't want this guy to know I was panicked and calling for help, so I pretend my boss is another city carrier just a few streets away. Hey Dave! I know you're working just a couple blocks from here, and I have a couple really heavy packages I need you to help me deliver. I'm on this street right now. My boss was so confused. He started telling me how he wasn't a few streets over and that I was calling the wrong person, while I'm practically yelling over him. Oh yeah, I can get the numbers off the packages. Hold on, let me get to the car. You just don't hang up yet. I can get them right now. Because I really didn't want him to hang up and be alone. This guy hasn't said a word to me, but he's still right on my heels, literally. Had I stopped walking, he would have ran my ankle over and tripped me. I make it back to the car and tell my boss what's actually happening, while this dude starts riding in circles around me. As I drive away down the street, I see him racing on his bike behind me, chasing after my car. I make a few turns down some blocks trying to see if I can lose him, and he's behind me the entire time until I reached the main road where he stops. The cops were called, and I was instructed to once again return to the street to finish up the mail, with the cops patrolling the area to hopefully bait this dude into getting caught. No surprise, but he never showed up. No idea how the situation is going to get handled yet, but hopefully something gets done. I'm 27 now, but this happened when I was 16. When I was a teenager, I had a turbulent home life. By the time I was 16, I no longer lived with either of my parents, but instead lived with my brother Nick, who was two years older than me. He got me a job at the fast food restaurant where he was a manager, so I could help him pay the rent. One night, both of us were at work along with two other employees. I got off work at 11 p.m. Nick's girlfriend Dan was coming to pick him up when he got off work an hour later, but I didn't want to wait there with nothing to do, and the walk home was down a well-led main road, so I decided to walk home. Unfortunately, I forgot that there was an area of the walk that wasn't well-lit, and it was a pretty long stretch of land. I had just walked away from the building I worked in, when I saw the outline of a man walking towards me in the opposite direction. I couldn't see his face in the darkness, but he was tall and lanky, with a distinctive gait. I didn't think he'd actually hurt me, but I figured it was better to be safe than sorry, and crossed to the opposite side of the road so we wouldn't cross paths directly. After it was out of sight, I crossed back since that was the side of the road I needed to be on, which henceforth will be referred to as the right side of the road. A few minutes up the road, I was in a slightly better lit area, but it was still pretty dark. I heard footsteps behind me, and turned around to see the same distinctive gate walking on the opposite side of the road, and walking pretty quickly, too. He passed me on the opposite side, and when he was a few yards ahead of me, he crossed the road in front of me and ducked into some bushes. I immediately crossed the road until I was well past where he was hidden and then crossed back to the right side. When I was sure he was out of earshot, I called the restaurant to speak to Nick. I told him what was going on, but that I didn't think the creep was still behind me. As I was saying this, I turned around to see the creep lighting a cigarette, once again on the opposite side of the road from me. I was coming up on a cluster of convenience stores, so Nick told me to go in and buy something, just to give myself enough time to lose the man. By the time I got there, the guy had already crossed to the right side of the road a few yards in front of me again, and I watched him duck behind the building. 
I went into the convenience store, walked around a bit, and then just bought a pack of gum. I felt like the clerk was suspicious of my behavior, but I actually thought it might be better if he called the cops on me. He didn't, and I left with my gum. When I left the store, I once again crossed the street to the opposite side, in case the guy was still behind the building waiting for me. There's a historic mansion on the right side of the main road, with a gate and a row of trees separating the property from it. As I was coming up on it, I saw the creep peek out over the gate to check if I was still coming. I was on the opposite side of the road, but I was still creeped out, and I'd had enough of this game of cat and mouse. I went back to the convenience store, and was about to call Nick again when I saw Ann's car pull into the parking lot. Apparently, after I got off the phone with Nick earlier, he called her and asked her to come get me. I got in and explained everything that had been going on. We drove past the mansion, and I saw a man standing still under one of the trees, waiting for me. I freaked out and yelled, Oh my god, he's still there! She pulled into the parking lot of the next store and called the cops. As she was on the phone with them, the guy walked right past her car and went inside. The cops were there in a minute or two, considering we were right next door to the police station. I got out of the car and told them all that had happened. As we were talking, the guy came outside and I pointed him out. One of the cops went to talk to him and came back to me a few minutes later. Apparently, the creep had told him that he was just walking to a friend's house. Both cops agreed that my account seemed a little too coincidental, but since he hadn't heard or threatened me, they couldn't do anything to him. Whenever this event crosses my mind, I like to make myself feel better by thinking he was just screwing with me after seeing that I was obviously intimidated by him, and that he wasn't really planning on doing anything. But when I think of what could have happened to me if he really did have malicious intent, it scares me that I would have been stupid enough to walk 30 minutes home so late at night with nothing for protection.